Believe Revival. If you're a visitor, I hope that by now someone has extended a hand of mercy and a five dollar bill to each one of you. Not really, but we welcome you in the Savior's name, whether you're a member or a guest. And this is a lively slog, how great the love of the Father. And part of the love of the Father is to prepare us for the next song, which is an update of a song that everyone here knows and probably knows by heart. The word amazing has been attached to a lot of songs in our hymnal and in our repertoire. What, what are some songs that come to your mind with the word amazing in them? Okay, okay, that was probably the one that we expected to hear first. Amazing Grace. What else? Uh, amazing Love by Charles Wesley. How can it be that thou by God shouldst die for me? I stand alone, in, oh, I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. What does amazing come from? Where is that word from? Now, if you're from Michigan, you want to say it's from Maize and Blue. Sorry, all my Ohio State fans. <laughs> but when we, when the English language folks came up with a word to describe grace, they used the word amazing. And you probably have never heard what amazing means. It comes from amaze. Do you know what amaze is? Anybody know what amaze is? Yeah. Yes. It's designed to confuse you. It's designed to keep you lost so you can't figure out how did I get here and how do I get out of here? The word maze describes a place they're in where you just can't explain. I can't, I can't explain how I got here and how am I going to go out. That is exactly how we describe grace. What is grace? Grace is that response to God that we have when we realize that God has shown us favor, but when we look within ourselves, we can't find it. Oops, I just yeah. caught my microphone off. We can't find anything that would earn the Father's love. We can't look within ourselves and say, ah, oh, now I know why God chose me. Within us, there's nothing. That's what's so amazing about grace is that we're confused about why God would choose us. There's no reason for it. He just chose us because He chose us. He chose us not for the good in me, but because of His choice in eternity. That's what the word amazing is designed to say to each other. Grace. It's amazing because there's no explanation for it other than it was the will of God to do it. Isn't God great? So today our attitude is what? Thanksgiving. Gratitude. Rather than, I deserve this. I deserve salvation. I deserve the love of the Father. We don't. It's due to something called amazing grace. Let's celebrate that this morning. We have many, many reasons to praise you and to celebrate redemption. Lots of them. But one is that we look at ourselves, Father, and we really cannot find a reason for it. We are prone to wander, our hearts are depraved, we are fundamentally selfish to the core, and yet you've chosen us to be a part of your family. Not because of our worthiness or our merit, but simply due to the character of God. Today we want to celebrate that in song. So if there's someone here, Lord, who came in here thinking, I deserve this, I deserve people to pay attention to me, I deserve God to hear my prayers, I pray that our time together would help release them from that bond and for the first time, they would understand that grace truly is a man. Fill us with your spirit, and may Jesus Christ once again come to us and speak to our need in this hour. We pray for his glory in Christ's name. A little anticlimactic with the, with the uh, sound. So could you just put your hands together and say thank you to the Thank you, Phoebe. And thank you, Chloe. I don't see if I see Chloe. Two good names right from the New Testament. Are they back there? They're just hiding. Well done. Singing, talking, teaching. Well done. Two future teachers in those two little girls. Yeah, I hope someday to be able to listen to them explain scripture and interpret it and apply it to life. They have a good teacher there. They have a good grandmother, a good mother as well. Thank you for taking care of them. Well, welcome back to the Word this morning. This 
want to make sure I don't knock that off. Join me for a moment of prayer, please. Our way, Father, of declaring our dependence upon you is to pray. When we pray, we're saying we need your help. We can't do this alone. Speaking is not the secret to the life of Christ. Our secret is to lean heavily and to depend entirely on the work of your spirit. Whether we sing, whether we pray, whether we study, whether we teach, it all depends on the life of the spirit. You showed us that in Genesis 1-2, all the way to the end. I'm asking, therefore, for the movement of your spirit among everyone here, everyone who has a burden, perhaps that keeps them from listening or from benefiting or from growing in their faith. Others are tied up in knots, Lord, bound to something, enslaved to something. Perhaps they come in feeling guilty. They feel ashamed. They feel dishonored. They feel degraded by their own lives. Let Lord Grace untie those knots and unloose those chains this morning. Others are discouraged, uh, hopeless about life, about their job, perhaps about their marriage. I, I pray that the Spirit of God would not allow those things to get in the way and to be an obstacle, a roadblock in the way of your rule and the way of your Spirit coming into their lives and providing whatever is necessary to lead them change today. Perhaps there's people here who really don't know the Savior in a living, relational way. It's more religious, uh, reciting things, memorizing, but there is no life within their breast. Uh, there's no fire burning. It's just a campfire with wood and stones and coals, but no life. So start fires today if there needs to be that. Light people up. Give them life. Give them your spirit to begin breathing uh, the, the wind of eternity. Let many good things happen as a result of your word, Lord, as we depend on the work of your spirit. Jesus did, the apostles did, and we want to do the same. This is your hour, it belongs to you. It's all about your glory, it's not about us. But we declare to you our incredible weakness, our need, our, needy, our neediness before you and our people. So feed your flock. And when they leave, Lord, I pray that they'd be better people, better equipped for what lies in them Monday and Tuesday. And to meet other people and to help them along the pilgrim way. We pray for your glory in Christ's name. Thank you. Uh, we often... Um, encourage people who show great patience. People who have, say, quick tempers and are not patient have to learn patience by the Spirit. Patience is a fruit of the Spirit. It's good for us to be patient, especially if you're raising family, working in a tough working environment. Patience just really pays off. If I can think of one thing for all parents, for all time, it would be learning to be patient. But there's a time when we need to stop being patient. There's a time when we need to start doing something and not put it off and not procrastinate. There's a time for us to do something and to act. Jesus shows us this in Luke chapter 10, excuse me, chapter 13, verse 10 through 17. And if you're not there, I invite you to join me for a few minutes, either on your phone or or on your hard copy. Luke 10 is the story of Jesus entering a synagogue in some unknown town. And he's there. He sees a woman. And the word woman is used twice in the narrative with an echo to Genesis 3 and 2. And he sees a woman that has been robbed of part of her humanity. She is bent over completely, and she's been that way for 18 years. That word 18 connects to the previous section in the New Testament in Luke, referring to the Tower of 
Siloam that fell and killed 18 people. And the whole concept of time, misinterpreting time, is carried over into this paragraph. And the same theme is being developed. We've seen how Jesus says it is important that we don't misinterpret the good times in our life, especially if we are not bearing fruit for God. It may be that we are living on borrowed time. God is giving us extra years to begin bearing fruit for Him. Don't procrastinate. Stop the process now. Don't wait. This story picks up that theme and individualizes it when we see needs in our own life, issues in our own life, and in other people's lives. The time is not to be patient. The time is to do something right now. And he meets resistance. The chairman of the board of the synagogue, as we will see as we read it, said, no, we're not doing it today. We're not going to heal this woman today. She needs to be healed the next day, because today is the Sabbath day. And so Jesus defiantly, intentionally, deliberately humiliates a religious leader in front of all his peers in order to make a point. There is a time to deal with issues. There's a time to deal with bondages and slaveries in our own life and in the life of people. My thoughts come to the civil rights movement. The Civil Rights Movement was an attempt to let African Americans enjoy the freedoms that the rest of the country enjoyed. They were under oppression, racism, segregation, mistreatment. And so a group of civil rights leaders led by Dr. King began marching, nonviolent protests in cities in the South. And in response, the white clergy said to King and wrote a letter to him, a public letter to him, saying, you need to slow down. You need to wait. America one day will become racist free. You're going too fast. You need to have patience. You need to slow down. And Martin Luther King wrote a letter. I will now read. I can read the whole letter. But it's a letter that ought to be considered in conjunction with today. Dr. King wrote these words. I've reached the regrettable conclusion that the Negro, the Negro's greatest stumbling block in his stride towards freedom, is not the white men's counsel or the Ku Klux Klan, but the white moderate who is more devoted to order than to justice, who prefers a negative peace, which is the absence of tension, rather than a positive peace, which holds justice. When you say, I agree with you in the goal that you seek, I cannot agree with your methods of direct action, you're telling me that you believe that you can set the timetable for other people's freedom. You tell Negroes to wait for a more convenient season for justice. He goes on. King's response in a letter to the white clergy who were moderates was, no, the time for direct action is now. We're not going to wait for a more convenient season. He wrote that letter from jail because he was arrested for being involved in a nonviolent there's a time to be patient. But when we see injustice, when we see slavery in our own lives, it's not good to say, when I get old, I'll deal with this issue. If you are tied up to something and it binds you, and you do not have freedom from that issue, the time to deal with it is not when you're old in a more convenient season. When is the time to do it? The time to do it is now. Let's read about that in Luke chapter 13. 
This passage is divided into two sections. First of all, we're going to see that rather than wait, Jesus frees a woman, a suffering woman, from a lengthy bondage on the day of the Sabbath, and he brought criticism for what he did. And in response, Jesus exposed the chairman of the board and the religious legalism of that congregation. He exposed their phoniness and their hypocrisy. Now, he was teaching, verse 10, in one of the synagogues. It's not named. And he was doing it on the Sabbath. And a woman showed up. Gune. This is the word that is used to describe the woman in Genesis chapter 2. It's the first word out of Adam's mouth. That's an echo here in this passage. We're going to see why in just a minute. There was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity, a spirit of a weakness, a spirit of suffering. And she had it for 18 years. And she was bent over completely. And she was not able, notice how Luke develops that thought, she was bent over completely and she was not able to stand up completely. So we are human beings built to stand on our feet like I'm doing right now. This is not the way God created me to be. Now, it's good that I can bend over and tie my shoes. Good. But I walk around on two feet, not like an animal, but like a human being. That gives me dignity and shows that in some way I'm like God. I stand up, like a tree stands up. But this woman is bent over completely. And she's been that way for 18 years, and she's in the synagogue. And rather than making up excuses why she couldn't attend the synagogue, can you see her shuffling to worship? Every Sabbath day for 18 years? Would you go to worship if you were bent over? And people would say, man, that's weird. Have people look at you and make faces at you and make jokes about you? I don't know if I would. There she is. This woman is suffering physically, but not in anything about her faith has suffered. She's there, she's faithful. But she's robbed of a certain portion of humanity. She's bound by a spirit. So what's Jesus going to do? He knows he's there on the Sabbath. He knows what the religious leader is going to say to him. He knows that it's going to bring resistance. So what does he do? He defies the religious leader and the religious establishment and he goes ahead and he heals her. Let's read about that. And when he saw her, the zoom lens of his camera just focuses on this woman. Jesus called her over and he said to her, here's the second time that the word woman is used. He said to her, Gunai, woman, you are untied from your infirmity. You are released from your infir for infirmity. And he laid his hands upon her. And immediately she stood up straight and glorified God. Right there, right there is a picture of what you and I were made to do from the start. We are made in God's image to stand up and give glory to God. That's why we're made. That's the purpose of the man. That's the purpose of the woman. Both Adam and Eve are portrayed as priests in the presence of God in paradise, in the garden, in the first promised land. And their goal, their purpose of life is to glorify God. So Jesus has restored a woman to her rightful purpose. That's the idea. Jesus has defiantly got against the religious establishment and he has restored her to what she was designed to be, a worshiper of God. The word there is doxa. She glorified God. That tells me that her faith had not suffered through those 18 years. If she had been healed 
and she had grown bitter and entitled and was resentful of God. She would not have praised God. She would have said, what took you so long? But the first thing she did was to glorify God. But notice there's resistance. The ruler of the synagogue, the president, chairman of the board, answered and was indignant that he had Jesus had healed her on the Sabbath. And so he said to the crowd, why did he speak to the crowd? The crowd had, had nothing to do with it. But he's a coward. He doesn't want to speak directly to Jesus. So he speaks to the people. He scolds them. And this is what he has to say. We have six days in which we must work. Therefore, come on those days and be healed and not on the Sabbath. Jesus could have said, okay, I'll tell you what, let's compromise. <laughs> let's compromise here. I maybe shouldn't have done that. You know, when I think about what I've done, I've riled you up. I probably should have chosen a better way. <clears throat> I timed that just perfectly so that those of you who are sleeping would wake up. But instead of uh, saying, you know, maybe we need to kind of find a middle road for this issue. I promise I won't heal anymore on the Sabbath day if it's going to rile you up. I promise I'm not going to offend you if I heal on the Sabbath day. You know, I've already made you mad. I don't want to make you mad again. No, what does he say? Here, he shames this religious leader. He shames him in front of his peers. This is what I love about Jesus. He could care less about social standing, about what people say when he does the right thing. He says, come on, dude. A dude is in the Greek. No. <laughs> the Lord answered and said, what's the next word? You phony. You phonies. It's plural. You phonies. You pretenders. Doesn't each of you, who's he speaking to? Religious leaders. Doesn't each of you, doesn't each of you untie on the Sabbath day his ox or his donkey from the stall or the manger? It's the same word used in Luke 2, where Jesus was laid, and lead it to drink? What's the answer to the question? What's the answer to that question? Do they say to a donkey who's thirsty on the Sabbath day, sorry dude, you got to wait till tomorrow. I know you're thirsty. I know you're thirsty. I know you need water, but you know what? It's the Sabbath day. We ain't untying you. No. These men these religious men were more concerned about their animals than people. Suffering people more concerned about their dumb donkeys than a suffering woman. Each one of them, when the donkey got thirsty or the ox got thirsty, untied it and let it to drink. They were doing more work on the Sabbath than what Jesus did. What did Jesus do on the Sabbath? Altogether, what did he do to constitute work? What did he do? He spoke. He said, woman, you're free. You're untied. And secondly, he put his hands on her. That's all he did. That constituted work in the eye of this religious leader. And yet they untied a knot on a tether, a rope of some sort, and then led the donkey to a water chamber of some sort. That was more work. They looked at the law and made it as tight as possible when dealing with needy people. But when it came to animals, they loosened that law enough so that they could find a loophole in the law and bypass it. It was all about them. It wasn't about the person standing in front of them for 18 years, this woman. <clears throat> this woman, verse 16, this woman, a daughter of Abraham, she has been tied up by Satan 
for ten and eight years. Isn't it therefore a must that she should be untied from her bond on the Sabbath day? Wouldn't that be a must? And the answer is what? Yes. It's a must. She must be released on the Sabbath day. Why does he say daughter of Abraham? Why didn't he just say this woman, she's been tied up for 18 years, it's time for her to be released? Why did he say daughter of Abraham? See, nothing is in the text just for filler material. Everything is calculated. Every phrase is calculated. Why say daughter of Abraham? Jesus has already hinted at the way the woman was originally created. She's a woman. She stands and glorifies God. That takes us back to our original purpose. When he says, daughter of Abraham, he confers on her the dignity that all of us here who are believers in Christ have. We are children of Abraham by faith. And that elevates us. That elevates us to the very, very top. This woman is valuable. You don't consider her worth more than a shovel full of dirt, but in God's eyes, in God's eyes, she is a woman in the trail and in the footsteps of Abraham, a woman of great worth and value and dignity. You don't see it, and that's why I'm defying you and I'm showing you that you are nothing but a dunce and a fool and a phony. And he heals her deliberately and intentionally. On the very day he said it couldn't happen. There's another person, by the way, in the Gospel of Luke, who's attached to Abraham. Do you remember him? Chapter 19. After Zacchaeus, a thug, dishonest, wealthy tax collector, repented, publicly in front of Jesus at his home what did Jesus say you are what a son of Abraham that shows the power of Jesus to save to restore a man like Zacchaeus to his original design and original purpose here Jesus does it for a woman and restores her for her original purpose lets her stand up straight and return her to the glory that she deserved. And the response, and it says, and when he had said these things, all his opponents were ashamed, humiliated, and the crowd, remember the crowd that the man scolded? <laughs> what, what happens? They rejoiced at all the what? Well, the word here is glory and all the glorious things which were being done by Jesus. Let's, let's summarize and then move quickly into how this applies to us. What is Luke doing with this story? He has moved into the issue of don't procrastinate. In the early chapters of, or the early paragraphs of chapter 13, and the last two paragraphs in chapter 12. Don't procrastinate. Don't think that good times in your life mean that you can just wait to live for God. No, you may be living on more time. <clears throat> Repent now. Live for God right now. When we look at our own lives and see that we're in bondage, we are tied up to something. And in this culture, there's a lot of, there's a lot of ropes that tie people up. You may be tied up this morning with resentment and bitterness towards God or towards somebody in your family or some friend or some leader somewhere. And that colors your life. You may be angry at God for something that he did. Integrity would require that all of us here in that position would say, I am tied up. The New Testament makes a big deal about how anger is an open door to the enemy. How resentment opens the door to satanic influence in our life and colors everything we do. If you see a resentful person, it's written on their face and it affects everything they do. And they are basically our walking spirit of the enemy. They mess up churches, they mess up marriages and families. Resentful, bitter people are tied up. 
Today, that person, I would hope, would say, that's me. It's time to be free. I hope today is the day that you begin to ask for help to untie that knot and to be released by Jesus. Ask him to speak to you and to place his hands on you or somebody else's hands, discipling you, helping you to get rid of that knot, to untie that knot. But there are some other knots that, uh, that tie people up. And you know what they are. There's a lot of bonds out there. It can be substance abuse. It can be materialism. And the impact of money on our lives, which is huge in the Gospel of Luke. Uh, Darrell Bach told me uh, years ago at a faculty meeting at Dallas, watch out if you ever preach through the Gospel of Luke because you'll be stepping on white middle class toes. He said, be careful. I said, okay, I'll be careful. Apparently, I wasn't careful enough in certain situations. I won't say anything further. But, today is the day for you to consider it's time for me to be released from whatever it is that holds me. It's time for me. Jesus would agree, today's the day to set you free. You're a son of Abraham, or you're a daughter of Abraham. What is it that binds you and keeps you from being free inside? What is it? You, you probably know it better than I do. And if the Spirit is talking to you right now, pleading with you, why not think about, okay, I've got, I need a plan. I need some help. Let's move forward into a time of freedom rather than being in bondage. Today's the day. As I mentioned at the, at the first, there is a time to be patient. This is not one of those times. Because what happens when we say, well, I'll do it you know, a couple of months. What happens? Those months go by, and then what? You say, well, I'll do it in a few more months. And you just keep putting it off and putting it off. Jesus shows that you are not fully restored yet. But he wants to restore you. And that's what Jesus is all about, restoring people to the way they were originally designed, both men and women, giving them equal dignity as people. He saw this woman. There was a lot of people in the congregation, but he saw this woman, and he sees you. He always sees the neediest person and looks at them, spots them, and speaks to them. If you're that needy person, respond today. He wants to free you and set you free and untie whatever it is that binds you. Some things that come to my mind regarding how this is used today. Um, I am still of the opinion that the church worldwide holds people in bondage through tradition, through rituals, through ceremonies, through all sorts of inventions that don't have their origin in the Bible. And what they do is they hold people in fear, in superstition, in bondage. And I think I still hear a protest against that from Jesus. I would hope that from this congregation there could be some men and women, some prophets and prophetesses who would grow up and have it as their calling to protest what's going on in the world church worldwide. Inventing things for Christians to do and say and go through. Inventing types of church government that have no basis in scripture. Jesus still is opposed to that and we need people to make it known. Just like Jesus made it known here. Perhaps the final thing we should suggest here is the danger that all leaders find themselves in. This man, in this passage, was a leader. And he was unaware, perhaps, until Jesus hit him in the gut, but he was unaware of how he had used his power to create weakness and to keep people in bondage. If you're a leader in your family, in your school, in your hospital, in your business, in your shop, in your church, our goal as leaders is to set people free, not bind them, not add things to an ever-growing list of do's and don'ts. Our goal is to help you find freedom in Christ. Freedom to be you. 
And there's a number of areas where, for example, women are still held in bondage in church. They're treated as daughters of their husbands rather than as equals to their husbands. Husbands still speak and look down on women and treat them as kids, treat them as children with disrespect or abuse. We shouldn't have to go there in the church, but it's true. As leaders, we have to watch for that and call it out when we see it. But there are literally, I believe, millions of women believers in this nation alone who are under the thumb of their husbands or under the thumb of the leadership team that does not recognize their fundamental equality. And there's passages of scripture that show women doing things in the church which men would cringe at and protest. There needs to be, in my judgment, a lot more freedom given to women simply because the text shows them doing these things. So leaders have to carefully look at their policies and say, are we giving people the freedoms that God has given them, or are we restricting them? Are we restricting them, binding them, keeping them bent over, and not fulfilling their purpose in life? Would you rather err on the side of judgment or mercy? I would want to err on the side of freedom rather than restriction. Wouldn't you, at the end of the day? To err on the side of grace rather than restriction? Leaders have a big job, and we fail, and we need help. We need your prayers. But I'm hoping that the future leaders here, as well as our current leaders, all of us, will be striving to help people to be free and to enjoy the Christian life, and to be perfectly free to fulfill the purpose for which all of us have been created, to stand like trees and to glorify God, to praise Him. That's what leaders do. They don't enforce their bullying tactics or their rules. They set people free and bring the best out of them by exalting Christ and following his path. Come for me for a minute. Follow this woman when she went home after the synagogue. Eighteen years. I, I can't imagine. She couldn't look up at the night sky and see the stars or the sun. The beauty of a rainbow. She's bound. Follow her home. She walks through the door. And what do her kids say? Mom! Or her grandkids. Or her husband. Or her mom and dad. She's been touched by Jesus. Wouldn't that be a glorious day? And the next Sabbath when she comes back? Oh! Wouldn't that be a glorious day? Man, that's the taste of freedom. That would be the taste of freedom. And that synagogue room had no eye for the beauty of that, no ear to hear her praise and her glorifying God. There's nothing better for us to do as human beings, as men and women, to lift our voices, lift our hands, and to glorify God. That's what we were made to do. If you're not there, why not change today and begin untying those knots and to do what God created you to be. Thank the Lord for Jesus who came as a second half to set us free for our purpose and changes us into sons and daughters of Abraham. Who, what? Follow God by faith. That's his story. I hope if you haven't done that today, you will trust Christ and begin following him as your Savior. Thank you for listening. Let's stand. Let's pray. Freedom, Lord, is such a good word. Free. Free to love you. To love others, love neighbors. To 
pursue justice, to help others to experience freedom who are jailed. Jailed either within or without. There are some people here, Lord, who still are in some sort of a chain. It's degrading for them. It's embarrassing for them. They're not happy. And perhaps they've just put it off. Perhaps they've given up. Maybe they've given up hope. But in Christ, all things are possible. He's the great liberator. Let today new hope spring up. New incentive and motivation for whatever the bondage is, begin, Lord, releasing it. Whatever not it is, begin untying it. Give them humility to ask for help. They need help. They need people. As Paul says, carry each other's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Let them have that freedom to ask for help so that one day they can be free from whatever chain is on the inside, some chain on the outside. We want to be people of freedom to help others to find the same. We ask this for your glory in the church and throughout the world in Christ's name. Of that, whatever you call it, ministry of the podcast, well done. You, you've got a really good radio voice. I really like listening oh, to his voice. Does. Yeah. Far better than my own. I don't like to listen to my own voice. And thanks for Michelle for broadcasting. Just as an example, uh, Today, this afternoon, I'll be recording four of them, and they'll come out in the next month or two. I'm not sure, but why is, for example, Jesus in Isaiah 9, 6, why is he called the Everlasting Father? Does that mean there's two fathers in the Trinity? It's a very easy answer uh, if you understand how to navigate around the text. So that, that's one of them. Um, another one is uh, uh, that I'm dealing with, was Paul uh, a misogynist? Was Paul anti-female? So I've gone through every single reference in the entire New Testament where Paul deals with women, and you'll be surprised at Paul's attitude towards women. Um, the issues in the past have been, like you mentioned, uh, divorce. Uh, divorced people have carried a stigma in the church for a long, long time. And uh, when you actually examine what God has to say in the original text, in the Greek text, the Hebrew text, you find out that there is a totally different attitude to it. And what we want to do is strive towards freedom. Freedom for people. Uh, and not look at these restrictions which have been created by tradition rather than an accurate understanding of the biblical text. So these are just illustrations of, it pays to study the text carefully and do it all your life because it gives freedom to people. People who have suffered great pain such as in divorce for a lot of women in the Christian church. Uh, God's attitude towards women has been not the attitude towards women in a church. And we're trying to bring our attitude closer to God's. Isn't that the right way to do it? Yes. Rather than try to convince God about <laughs> our attitude, we'd rather go his way. He has a much better, superior attitude towards women. Thanks for listening. I'm starting to preach again. I don't want to do that. Hey, second message? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. All right. Yes, stay tuned. Psalm 146, I thought, is appropriate for us to leave with today. In view of the events, in view of today, um, there's a part for me, it's called Leader. There's a part for you and me together, all. And then you can follow the remainder of this. So carefully, carefully come through the blessing with me, follow with me, and uh, say it by faith. We do not put our trust in people, though powerful or popular. We put our trust in you. You are our help. You are our hope. You are our maker. You uphold the cause of the oppressed, the weak and hungry, the prisoner, the alien, the fatherless, and the widow. You, you rule, rule forever. Let us go forth in renewed trust. Thanks to you, God. Amen. You are.